Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of Dal Belly Knits. My name is Annabelle and you can find me here on YouTube as Dal Belly Knits. But you can also find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Dal Belly. And there's a group for this vlog uh, on Ravelry and you can search the group tabs for Dal Belly Knits. I love making the uh, cheeky openers. Um, I just don't know if I'm going to get to it this time, so this may or may not be uh, pertinent uh, information in the vlog, but I decided to record a little bit earlier since it's been longer than a week. Also, I will be on an all-day walk through the, the beautiful countryside where we live with my daughter's primary school tomorrow. So <laughs> I'm probably going to be pretty tired, might have a little bit of a headache, and I don't know how I'm going to feel after that's all over. So I figured I better get in here and um, share with you some of the whips, hoes, and FOs that I got going on, as well as talk to you about our most recent trip to the Shetland Islands. So yeah, I'll just get right into it and start with uh, works in progress. Last um, episode, I um, last couple episodes, I talked about the reusable snack bags that I make for the kids' lunch bags and that it was about time to probably go ahead and make some more because they've seen better days and um, definitely, mm, pardon me, have uh, gotten use out of them. So I decided to go with a um, Doritos design, like the black, hot, chili, peppered, spicy Dorito, something or the other, which it was black yarn. So it was a little bit of a pain to work with in terms of not being able to see it properly. But um, ultimately, it's just a tube that goes around stockinette stitch. Um, I did it 60, about 60 stitches on a, I want to say a four millimeter needle, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so I've done, I've done the body of, of the bag and I haven't um, sewed it together or done anything to it yet because the next thing I need to do is put the design on the outside. So I will probably do some duplicate stitching for the words Doritos and try to make the little design and the picture of the bag that I chose it doesn't have like the little Dorito chips on it but the other Dorito bag that I did I did little chips on it I really like that so I'm gonna make it my own design I'm gonna add the little Dorito chips so I'm about well I'm probably more than 50 percent of the way done depending on how you look at things because after I'm done doing the applique and the top stitching and, and stuff like that, I will have to make a actual insert. I use PVC plastic material. Um, I don't, I'm not even exactly sure what it's called. I think of the material that you would get to put on top of a picnic table. That's what I think, picnic tablecloth. But I think it's called like PVC plastic or PVC cotton fabric or something like that. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and how I finish it is going to determine my ultimate happiness. Sometimes things go really well and you're really excited. Sometimes they don't. Kind of reminds me of the... Um, Susan Claudino designs that I love to do for my family for Valentine's Day. Um, I've done the little fairy cakes and I've done bonbon and um, I have a couple lined up for the upcoming Valentine's Days, but I will construct them because they're really fun to construct and to knit. Um, I love the way that they come together. I always kind of feel like a little bit of a um, Daryl from The Walking Dead. I got like a little uh, stitch marker full of little bunny body parts. But <laughs> I, so I get all that through and I stuff it and, and it's a completed object, but it doesn't have any facial features. And they'll sit 
void of face for a little while before I can get around to deciding that I'm going to try and and do the facial features and because that's just it can totally make or break the object and sewing is not a strong suit of mine so it usually does concern me and I'm always um, I have trepidation about doing it so I kind of feel the same way about this I'm like it's kind of like yay I got the body bag but uh, okay so I will gather the items that I need and crack on hopefully we'll see I'm not sure so that's the snack bag um, other works in progress uh, last time I also showed you the beanie that I'm making for charity for charitable purposes so this is a um, pattern called the ramble on beanie by Gretchen Tracy I just really love this pattern it is addicting to knit because um, it's repetitive and it's like oh I just want to get to the end of that round and that particular repeat section and I do like the way that it comes out I think you can see it really well here that it uses a technique of knitting in the stitch below like every other round so you have some elongated stitches and then she also does off centering of um, knit and purl so I really do like the way it looks and I like the way it knits up and knits up real easy I think the last time I showed it to you I only had like this much done and now I'm up to here and I didn't take this with me when we went away so I've probably done from here up to here in the past day or so in addition to other projects that I was working on so it goes really fast and it makes a nice hat and I'm using what I have uh, on hand although I have something to share uh, when I get to the magical memories portion of the show um, so yeah if you are into using what you have on hand and um, participating in charitable works give this beanie a go and if you can't find a place to send um, hats or scarves to um, get in touch with me leave a message in the um, comments below or get in touch with me on Ravelry I have not only <clears throat> do I have a specific uh, place in mind that I was sending these beanies that I was making I know of other um, individuals who collect um, make collections for the homeless uh, every year so I have uh, a few places that I could send these um, hats to or direct you to send these hats to um, if that's something that you're interested in and uh, you want to know more about uh, leave me a message get in touch uh, next right oh okay so we went to the Shetland Islands. We were there for uh, four days, four or five days. So I only took a few projects with me and one of them I did take with me was my Berta fire. So I got a lot of knitting done on that. I'm really, really happy. I don't know if I uh, mentioned it last episode, but definitely in the previous episodes, I was talking about the fact that I was having a problem with getting holes in in the uh, knitting uh, because of the particular wraps and turns that are used um, long story short I wasn't following the instructions so if I didn't say following the instructions helps following the instructions helps I don't have that issue anymore now that I'm actually doing the German short rows and what is suggested by the designer which by the way Bird of Fire is a pattern by Sarah Wilcox and I am knitting this as part of a knit along that is being hosted by Mel Brown crafting podcast it's such a mouthful Mel <laughs> um, 
So if you want to participate in that, you can too. Just go on over to Ravelry and um, search for her in the groups tab and you'll see a thread about the Bird of Fire. Additionally, if you are um, going to participate and you want to share your progress, you can share your progress on Instagram by using the hashtag Bird of Fire K-A-L. So I am up to, let's see, that's the back. Here's the front. Okay, how many flames? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ten of the nineteen flames done. Um, it's called Bird of Fire. So in the pattern, these sections here are called uh, flames, and this section here is called sky. Uh, because of the colorway that I chose and the inspiration that I had. I've call, I'm calling mine Water Phoenix, so I do think of these as fins and this as uh, water. Regardless, there's supposed to be 19 of these, so I'm up to 10. So I only have uh, more than 50% complete, um, although there's also a neckline that needs to be knitted. So after I get done, blub all the way over to 19, then you have to go along the edge here and pick up a massive amount of stitches um, and finish the neckline. So I am super happy with this. I can't wait to see it as a finished product. Pro project product. I think I just melded those two words together. I uh, like the yarn. It feels good. Um, this yarn here is an Easy Knits. Um, yarn and then this one here I dyed myself so um, yeah very happy about this very excited to get it finished excited to block it um, to see how big it's actually gonna be um, and come out and I will be excited to wear it although probably by the time I'm done well I, I might get some out of it it's kind of chilly here all year round but this strikes me as a, um, a springish, a lighter weather type shawl. So, I don't know, we'll see. I'm sure I'll wear it whether it's appropriate or not in terms of weather, cause that's the way I am. <laughs> but yeah, was really happy. It was nice to work on that too, because it was it's an easy pattern to follow um, and I was able to, to, to do that uh, even though we were traveling uh, and it, it, on trains, on boats, and stuff like that. And it ended up being um, my go-to uh, project. I think I knitted the most of that, although I did bring some crochet as well that I'm going to show you in a little bit here. Uh, other works in progress I've shown you and you've seen and there's still works in progress and there really isn't much change on it so it's not worth um, pulling it out at least I don't think I have my fiery venomous tentacula I didn't take that with me because like I said in the previous show I feel like I need to sit at a table with that because I got beads I got the little tiny crochet hook and then I got my pattern and so I didn't want to take that and be fiddling with that and oh you know geez can you imagine if all my beads were strewn all over the train like that would have been a major disaster so I didn't take that with me so that actually hasn't gotten any love the other work in progress I have going on is my husband's birthday socks I think I've knitted another inch I didn't take them with me but since we've been back I think I probably knitted another inch so I got like two inches on the cuff left and I definitely need to finish that because his birthday is imminent um, but it's just two inches of one by one twisted rib so that shouldn't be a problem if I have to stay up the night before his birthday and finish it I can do that uh, trying to think looking at my notes um, yeah those are all my works in progress that I have going on right now although it is June and you know what that means 
I'm going to say it, and, you know, you'll have to forgive me, but Christmas knitting, Christmas knitting, uh, yeah. For me, I do uh, plan ahead, and I don't, I've never timed myself or really timed, either timed myself while I was knitting or crocheting something or like really paid attention to how long it would take me to complete a project. Some people you're like, oh, well, how long did that take? And, and they, they're able to give you an answer straight away. I don't have that sense of time when I'm crafting. So I, I, I do think maybe I'm slower than everybody else. And that's why I start Christmas knitting in June. I used to start it in July, because Christmas in July, like that used to be a thing. When layaway was a thing, you know, they would have, stores would have Christmas in July sales and, you know, come and get your Christmas gifts and put them on layaway and then you had like six months to pay it off. So I started doing that, but I wasn't finishing on time. Um, so I moved it back uh, to June. So. Christmas knitting is going to start real soon, which is going to make uh, recording a little difficult. Um, so I'm going to have to think about that. I'm not sure how I'm going to share what I'm working on without spoiling it for the people that I'm working on, working on it for. <sighs> That's another mouthful. Yeah, so, I, you know, because like I've seen... Um, vlogs and podcasts and people will be sharing um like a, a mystery knit along and they're like you know they're up to date with the clue the latest clue and they don't want to spoil it for anybody else so they'll say like okay i'm going to show you the shawl and you know you need to look away and then they'll they'll show and and whatnot and then they say okay you can look back now so that's that's one idea uh, of doing it that way but I still kind of felt like, and they, I'm sure they can't, you can't help yourself. You start talking about something that you're doing and you, you start talking about how you like it. You start describing uh, bits and pieces about it. So I even thought like, oh, like the person, if they did look away, they were probably still getting clues as to what was coming because they could hear what the um, host of the show was saying about the project so I am the kind of person who really likes to keep things under wraps I don't like to give away um, secrets or surprises that's my personal preference as well I love a surprise I don't want to know uh, what I'm getting for Christmas um, <laughs> when we were kids my one sister would always be looking in the closet to try and find the gifts whereas I was like I, I don't want to know so, um, yeah, I'm going to have to think about that and how I'm going to proceed going forward. But Christmas knitting is going to have to start like now. So that's that's coming. Right. OK, now we can talk about finished objects. Yay! Um, I finished the baby blanket. So I'll get that one first got that right here uh, this is a baby blanket for the niece that I've been working on for quite a while probably longer than was necessary um, this is it's folded in half so now I can't see me and you can't see me but it's a C2C blanket or an end-to-end -end, corner to corner I used um, stash yarn but I used it strategically so that it is kind of asymmetrically symmetrical, that there is a repeat in the color pattern, but the thickness of the stripes varies. So I'm super excited that this one is done. I do have a few um, ends to weave in and um, bits to cut off, but we'll be packing that up and put it in a box. Um, along with... Uh, a copy of the book The Gruffalo. Um, I read recently somewhere that The Gruffalo is Prince George and Princess Charlotte 
and I'm sure soon to be Prince Louis's favorite book. So I think it's just fitting, a, a fitting book for a princess um, that's on her way. So we'll be putting that in the mail and get rid of that. I'm getting rid of it. So <laughs> I'm done. I'm super happy to be done. Uh, be putting it on its way in the post to the niece. Also, while we were away on vacation, um, I mentioned that I took knitting. I took the Bird of Fire and I worked on that. I also took some crochet. Um, uh, it, this is um, for the people who are in the States. British school is kind of all year round. Not completely, but almost all year round. So instead of having three months off in the summer, starting in like end of May, beginning of June, school goes until almost the end of July. And we have larger breaks throughout the year. Two weeks off at Christmas, two weeks off at Easter, and then week long breaks um, here and there. Um, our trip to the Shetland Islands was just during one of those week long breaks so now the kids are back in school and they'll be in school until the end of July. So they call those periods terms. So this is the last term of the year. And I thought that for the last term of the year, my girls could probably use some new sweetie bags. Uh, that's what I call them. I um, will insert pictures uh, because I can't show them to you because they're actually in use right now. It's a school day, girls are in school. But I um, actually have an older one here. As you can see, it's a little bit dingy. Um, the cord has gotten really stretched out from use. Um, basically, this is one of those things that started out for me as a way to solve a problem that I had. When the girls were real little and they were in primary school, um, the school hosted uh, something they called a tuck shop and it was like one day a week where the kids could bring in a little bit of pocket change and they could buy like um, a, a little drink and like a biscuit or something like that for snack time. Well, most of the girls, little girls wear skirts or they wear the pinafores and they didn't have any pockets. So I was trying to think, you know, like how can I send them into school with money and have them not lose it? Um, so I thought I would just make one of these little bags and um, it's very simple construction crochet in the round and then crochet up the side and make little double crochet with some chain one spaces and then chain along uh, string for the cord and then it just pulls together and you can tie it um, in a little little bow like this. Um, as you can see this string has gotten really really long because <laughs> it's cotton so it stretches. Um, but yeah that's kind of how it started and I would put a little bit of money in there and then it could go into their lunch pail so that it wouldn't get lost. But it also became a, a catch-all for other things because again they didn't have any pockets so like if they needed to bring some tissues with them. Tissues went in the sweetie bag. If they needed um, a cough drop or a um, cough sweet, because uh, they had a little bit of a scratchy throat, it went inside the sweetie bag. Um, I don't think it got the name sweetie bag until after I started putting notes inside. Since it was, it became a, such a regular occurrence that I would be putting these things in their lunch bags every day, I decided to start adding little notes that said sweet things on them. Um, so that's kind of how the bag became known as a sweetie bag with your sweetie note, a little piece of candy got tucked inside. Um, and it's basically been a tradition for, oh, I don't know how many years now, a while. Um, my, my girls still take them to school, even though they go to, s almost all of them go to secondary school. Uh, next year in September, my youngest will go to secondary school. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the girls still take them, and you know, as kids get older and they enter the teenage years, you start to worry about things like, are they going to get teased uh, for something like that? And 
they haven't. And as, again, it's kind of like it was with the um, reusable snack bags. The other kids are like, what is that? Like, what, what is it that you got? And um, a lot of them have responded like, oh, that's really cool. I wish my mom would do that. A couple kids have asked my kids for me to put notes inside <laughs> the bags for them. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's definitely been a positive experience all around. And it's something I'm going to continue. Um, my husband's got a sweetie bag. He gets a, a note, too, in his lunch uh, as well. Um, but anyway, uh, these ones are pretty beat up. This is my one daughter's. Um, my oldest daughter's was all white. I don't know what possessed me to make something that was going with a child to school in a lunch bag all white. But it was probably that was what I had on hand. Um, so that one's really not nice looking <laughs> uh, so I redid them and I was able to get some really vibrant colors it's uh, sugar and cream lily sugar and cream cotton worst of weight cotton yarn um, and so I did three of them uh, the one colorway was called love uh, the pinky one is called love uh, the blue one is called swimming pool uh, and then the multicolored one is called psychedelic so I really enjoyed those colorways and those colorways are representative of my children's personalities so um, they're excited they were happy um, and it's a good way to start the last uh, slog of days of school until summer uh, officially starts for the school uh, at the end of July and then you don't, they don't have to go back until September uh, again so yeah so that was uh, the other finished object that I had to show and I did those uh, on the train pretty much on the train I did a lot of that on the train the crocheting um, on our journey they don't they do not take long at all um, those bags if you're dedicated to sitting down and just uh, you know banging it out also I wrote down what I did <laughs> so um, I hopefully will be able to write that all up and put that up as a pattern on Ravelry as well so that'll be pattern number two Yay! <laughs> um, provided I can figure out Ravelry um, this is a little bit of side tangent uh, I love Ravelry for the way that it allows you to basically keep very detailed notes as to what you're doing on your projects if you are uber organized which i am not but i can see if you're really organized you know exactly what you have in your stash you know what you want to make with it i can see how all those things linked up link up when you're getting ready to start the pattern or start the project you create the project it's already been in your queue you've decided you're going to use this particular yarn or wool and it all kind of just streamlines together in order for you to just you know click um, hook it or put it on the needles uh, and and start the project however uh, that was pretty much all I used Ravelry for up until recently I never participated in the groups um, or the discussion threads because for me it's not very intuitive the way that the threads go and how each comment or each reply to the thread is just chronolo chronologically listed instead of um, if the reply was in reply to something else instead of them inserting it where it would make sense in terms of reading it um, so I always found that a little bit um, maddening and, and difficult to deal with posting this pattern on Ravelry <laughs> was a little bit difficult as well there were um, there was a box that was there um, that I didn't know what it meant and when I looked uh, for the instructions on how to do that um, on Ravelry they had a like a little wiki guide how to do it but 
the pictures that were part of the instructions didn't include that box. So I was, yeah. Uh, I know it's probably going to be sacrilegious that I'm saying not nice things about Ravelry. Um, and, you know, they're not terribly not nice. It's just there are parts of Ravelry that really stump me and confuse me. And perhaps it's just me. Perhaps I, you know, my brain's not working right. I don't know. And I mean, I use Ravelry every day. So uh, I can't say that I'm not a user um, of, of it. But I have found some things about it difficult groups, starting groups, being a moderator for a group, uh, just the threads, the discussion threads, those kinds of things. So since I find most of it difficult, it probably is just me. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of the thing, right? It's what everybody uses. Um, and I have loved tracking my projects in it, the progress. I like going in and clicking the little button that I finished it or that I'm up to 100% adding the smiley face so I definitely use it and I like using it for that purpose some of the other stuff um, yeah. um, but it is what it is and um, it's the way to be connected to everybody else in the community and speaking of which uh, people in the community have been very helpful um, and there are groups that can help you with this stuff as well. So I'm going to be delving into that a little bit more and hopefully I'll be able to understand Ravelry better and become a better, more efficient user because um, definitely liking and becoming excited about uh, patterns and designing and being able to share that with everybody else. Right now, my designs are really, really basic, and that's okay because you got to start somewhere. But I'm hoping that I'll be able to get what's inside my head out on paper um, for some of the things that, like the reclaimed wool projects that I had to put into hibernation so I could think about it. That's basically where I am stuck that like I know what I want it to look like I just don't know how to get it out onto paper um, actually even a little stumped with how to start it physically start it but whatevs that's me that's my problem and like I said this was all a side tangent <laughs> um, right we did whips we did finished objects um, I kind of jumped over hose because I included them in the whips. So like my husband's socks and um, uh, the tentacula is not really halfway done. That's less than halfway done. This is probably like a hoe because I just got to do the top stitching and make the little bag inserts. So I, I skipped over those items. But yep, whips, hose, FOs. Which would bring us to Magical Memories. Yay! <laughs> um, right. So our trip to the Shadowland Islands, it was literally a last minute holiday decision. Like I was saying um, at the beginning of the show, for people in the States, um, school here in England, in Britain, is uh, pretty much year round. It goes till July. Um, they have three terms and in the middle of the terms there's a week off or a break so they call it half term break we just that's what we just had and of course half term break everybody and their mother wants to go away on vacation somewhere so there's lots of people trying to get on a plane a train a bus whatever um, and it can make um, Finding accommodations, finding travel that's reasonable, um, difficult if you haven't already planned um, six months to a year in advance. And there are people who do that. We aren't those people. <laughs> uh, we are definitely, let's kind of wait and see what happens because um, you never know, things crop up and then you've booked a holiday and somebody gets sick and can't get your money back, etc., etc. 
but this was like straight from the heavens you must go to the Shetland Islands because <laughs> we decided that we weren't going to um, fly because there's five of us so that that can be expensive especially when you're trying to do it last minute uh, we decided to take the train and then the ferry so uh, it was a lot of traveling it took us about 24 hours to get from where we are up to Lurwick, uh, which is uh, one of the cities on the, the main island of the Shetland Islands. And um, yeah, so like we were trying to find accommodations uh, on the ferry on trying to book a cabin. We were trying to find a place to stay and it was just not lining up until like 10 o'clock at night on the Friday before like that last day of school on the Friday and then you have the week off. It was a miracle that I was awake at 10 o'clock at night, number one. Uh, and then it was just like, all of a sudden there was a cabin available on the ferry that wasn't there before. And then there was this apartment, uh, a self-catering apartment that was available. So it was like, oh, click all the buttons. Let's let's make it happen. So that was exciting. The process was exciting. And then uh, the idea of going was exciting. The girls probably not so excited about having to travel for 24 hours to get to a place where it was gonna be all about wool uh, for the most part. Um, but, you know, uh, that I explained to them that honestly, this wasn't just a trip for mommy. It wasn't all about the wool that the Shetland Islands are known for their wool. They're known for certain industries, wool being one of the primary industries. So getting to know about how they take care of their sheep, how they process their wool, is really getting to know them and their culture. I don't think they bought it, but that was what I said. It's my story, I'm sticking to it. So uh, we, got, um, we got up there and uh, took the ferry. So you arrive into port at like, you know, 7.30 in the morning, whatever. Um, and you can you can stay on the ship for a little while. So 9 a.m. We're off the ship, and the first place we're at is Jameson's. Oh, oh, oh! I forgot. So I forgot to tell you. So we take the train to Aberdeen in Scotland, and then the ferry leaves from Aberdeen and goes to Lurick. In Aberdeen, there's a store called Hobbycraft. It's like a mega. It's like a Hobby Lobby like a Michael's, like a Joann's. It was, it's a mega craft store. So I was like, woo! Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of time to look because we were concerned about getting on the ferry and, you know, making it in time. But, you know, just run in for a few seconds. Uh, and last episode, when I was talking about this, the um, beanie that I was making, I had made the comment that the first beanie that I had um, knit it used a wool um, that I had had in my stash but I wasn't familiar with it was uh, well yeah it was this it was this um, Sidar Hayfield bonus chunky that was it so in the hobby craft mm, walls of this stuff so I was like oh that's so awesome I was just talking about this and I was saying about how I'll probably just have to pick up a couple skeins. It is for charity after all. It's inexpensive, blah, blah, blah. Here it is. So I was excited and I picked up um, a navy. Um, what is it called? They don't, they don't name it. They just say a shade number, 0971. And then I did um, a pink one. So male, female whatever options. So I was excited to pick that up. So I'll be able to continue my um, charity knitting with the um, acrylic option, option that I was happiest with in the beginning. Right, so that was Aberdeen, get on the ferry, go overnight, wake up in the morning. First place we get off in Lorwick, and the first place we go to is Jameson's. I'm trying to find, here it is. Jameson and Smith. So I actually went, because there's more than one location of Jameson's in the town. 
Um, and in this place that we went to was um, not only a storefront to sell the wool, it was the wool brokers. So here's the card. That focuses in on that very well. Right, so going to the store, wall to wall to wall wool in every color under the sun. It was unbelievable. I only took a few pictures because it does make me kind of feel awkward to be taking pictures uh, inside. And it was like nine o'clock in the morning. Literally the store just opened. So I was the only person in there. But um, I did pick up a few things that I'll show you uh, in a few minutes. But as I was checking out, I was talking to the two ladies that were working uh, in the store. And I said to them, it must be overwhelming sometimes for people when they come in here because you have every color under the sun. And the woman agreed. She said that, yes, it's, it's usually a good idea to come in with a plan that you, you have a project in mind and that you're looking for something in, uh, in particular. Uh, and she said that if it's particularly busy, it can be even more overwhelming because there's a lot, you know, people in the store and just like, yeah, if you want it, they have it. Uh, so that was a, a, a delight to see and, and a bit overwhelming. Like I said, <laughs> I can't imagine. Well, I can't imagine because I went in there without a plan and I wasn't exactly sure what to pick up but I did pick up a few things um what I did pick up was this it's actually a West Yorkshire Spinners uh, uh croft um so Shetland Tweed 100% Shetland wool right um and this one here is called I think it says Dalsetter D-A-L-S-E-T-T-E-R um, and then there's this one, uh, Mary, Mary, Mary Field. They're kind of similar, um, that this one has, um, pinks and purples and even little tinges of violet there, a little pop of violet there. And then this one is kind of like the negative version of this. Like if you were, if you had taken a black and white photo of this, this is what you would get. So I couldn't uh, make a decision between the two, so I got both. Um, and it's only a hundred grams. Yeah, hundred grams, 166 meters, 182 yards of Iran weight wool. So it's limited, you know, you can make a hat, maybe a small cow, um, but I really liked it. I was drawn, this was the one thing in this, and it was in the center of the store that I was really drawn to. Um, so I grabbed those. And I also grabbed a little bag of bats. Uh, I know a few spinners, and I'm sure they'll be willing to help me do a little bit of spinning in exchange for some real Shetland wool. <laughs> so um, I grabbed one of those. Additionally to um, being in the shop right next to the, which I love this about, about I, I, I'm going to say I love this about this place, but this could be uh, any other place. These shops are all in unassuming little houses and, and things. The, the shop that I went to here, the, the wool brokers, we literally cut through a side road through a um like Mitsubishi dealer to get to this road and it was on a, a road that had terraced housing just you know homes and and here's the shop so I do find that interesting that it's just like there in the community and if you maybe didn't know what you were looking for or what it was you wouldn't necessarily be able to find it 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 blends with the rest of the aesthetic of uh the city and its environment so the shop is like this little house and connected to the shop is like a large garage in the garage was the sheep fleeces uh there were two guys working there and they had the bay 
of, of the, they had the big doors open of the garage. And I asked if I could come in and they were like, yeah. And, and the one guy was there and he basically was telling me, you know, it's the beginning of wool season. We just brought all the fleeces in. He said that they have like 620 crofters that they deal with. And a crofter could be a, a farm that has hundreds of sheep or it could be a, a small uh, homestead that has 20 sheep. Like it, it depends. Um, and crofting has fallen on some hard times lately. And I think that's part of the um, reason behind um, the campaign for wool to try and bring um, to try and bring attention to the wool industry and the crofters and exactly what it takes for you to be able to get your fancy dancy lovely little hanked up ball of wool that you're going to make something fabulous out of so it was very interesting to talk to him and it was nice that he let us come in and, and take pictures and talk to us a little bit about um, their wool season which is just beginning um, which in September it will be Shetland Wool Week so they've already put this out it's uh what's it September 22nd to the 30th of this year is Shetland Wool Week and every year um, it seems like it's Donna Smith every year <laughs> um, oh maybe not this year uh, designs a pattern this pattern and they give it out for free so you can make a hat um, to wear to wool week as you participate it looks like you can get this pattern from the website www.shetlandwoolweek.com and it does look like this pattern is by elizabeth johnston the mary dancers tory um yes yeah, so i grabbed one of those I don't know if I'll make it back for Shetland Wool Week in September, but it's a fascinating idea because we just went, you know, like at the bottom of the islands. There's all these other islands that you can go to by the ferries. I think you just have to have a little bit of time. It's, def it's uh, it, you know, it's Shetland Wool Week probably because it would take you a week at least to get to some of these places because of the times that the ferries run and the distance and, and how long it would take you to actually get places. And this was also something else that I picked up. There's a uh, craft trail and, and maker's trail. So basic, basically, whew. here's all the Shetland Islands and these are all the different kinds of crafters that you can go and see. Some of them are knitting, some of them are glass, some of them are jewelry. But if you re like, you really want to be, you know, instead of like a yarn crawl, it's a craft trail, here's your list for the Shetland Islands. And you'd have plenty of daylight because <laughs> it's what? May, end of May, beginning of June, there was probably three hours of darkness while we were there. So it's only gonna get lighter meaning less darkness um, as the summer months go on. So you got plenty of time. And some of the ferries, I'm rambling a little bit, I know. Some of the ferries run really late, probably because they can, because it's still daylight. So that's exciting. It's an exciting idea. I don't think I'm gonna get around to doing it, but if you're interested, if you go to Shetland Wool Week, you probably can find out information about that. The shetlandsartsandcrafts.co.uk is the maker of this book and I will include links to all these things that I mentioned the people the places the yarns uh, that I mentioned in the show notes in the description box below and I also put them um, in the forum for the group on Ravelry okay so Jameson was the first place that we went there were like I said quite a few uh, knit shops in the town. There was another Jameson's spot. Um, there was this really cute little place that I stopped at. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name right now. 
but I took a picture of the display uh, for their window because I thought it was really beautiful. It was a cancer awareness uh, display. Everything was purple that was in the window, so I took a picture of that. And um, looking at my notes, because obviously it was a family vacation, so we did family stuff. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I know you want to know all about the wool. Right, so we went to Jameson's. I checked out some of the other shops in town. And we went to the Shetland Textile Museum. <laughs> uh, yeah, the girls, the girls were not having it. But it was a short visit because it's a small place. Actually, the Shetland Textile Museum is in a small fishing house called a, I'm going to say it's called a bode because it's, it's that B-O with the two dots on top of it, D. I'm probably murdering how that's said. But this. And I did take pictures, and I'll try to put them in as well. So it's in this little fishing house, and they basically converted it so that they could house examples of uh, local knitting and um, show you how things have changed over time. This house in particular is the birthplace of Arthur Anderson, who is one of the founders of P&O uh, industry. Like, I think like P&O Ferries, I could be wrong about that too, but. So they basically historically uh, kept, kept the place because of its historical significance and they refurbished it and it looks really, really nice. And when you go inside, they of course have a shop and you know, lots of vendors, like maybe 40 different vendors have their stuff there, but it's like maybe one or two pieces a piece. So you get to see a lot of different sellers, uh, but the theme obviously is all the same. It's Shetland wool, it's um, hats, gloves, scarves, uh, lace shawls, things like like that so that that was nice but they also had a pretty big loom now I I asked the lady if I could take pictures inside and she said I could if I was using them for personal personal purposes so I really didn't want to share them here because this is you know public I did though take a picture of the cabinet of all the hats from the previous wool week years because those are free patterns that everybody can see. In particular though, there was an interesting hat that I took a picture of. It was a Japanese interpretation of the Babel hat. And everybody knows what the Babel hat is. So the Babel hat was the hat for Wool Week for 2015. And then I guess somebody in Japan knit, it, knit up the pattern, but they did their own interpretation of it. And it was really interesting hat, so I'll share that picture with you. But inside the museum, they their current display or their current um, is it is is the right word display catalog? Um, when you go to a museum, and they have certain things on display, and then that changes over time, whatever that's called, the current one is like memories from grandma's attic and they base they've asked people uh in the islands to like go go through your grandma's attic go through your own attic and are there things that you could share with us that highlight shetland shetland wool and knitting and techniques here and would you please also you know like include photos or write up a little letter about uh, the significance of the item that was just precious there was a knit um, wedding gown and in they had like a uh, a binder of the notes and um, letters that people had written and pictures so there was actually a picture of the woman in the wedding gown that was gorgeous it was gorgeous the story behind it was great there was a jumper that had been turned into a burra bear it was just all kinds of stuff so it was a small place they had a lot of lace um, lace on display as well. It was a small place, but I think it was really, 
worthwhile going if you're able to go and you're in that area I recommend it it's a little bit off the beaten path like it's outside of the city but if you're taking the ferry in it's 15 minutes away from the ferry port just in the opposite direction of the um, town so it was totally walkable which it had to be because we didn't um, we didn't bring a car with us it was totally worth going to the place and while I was there there were two uh, ladies one who was I guess manning the front door and then there was another woman her name was Pat and she was upstairs in the lace room because um, that's her thing she likes lace she likes knitting lace so she was really knowledgeable about the items and the pieces in the room she also was using a knitting belt <laughs> and she asked me if I wanted to give it a go and I was like yes of course I do because I've seen them and I understand what they're used for uh, uh, but I'd never used one so she had a uh, she had a, a knitting belt there she had a, a practice piece that other people had tried on so I was able to give that a go and that was that was cool she personally uses it because her right hand was injured so that does help her to be able to knit and um, not have the problem with her hand and she said it also improves tension and I noticed my knitting was a lot tighter um, on that I was it was so tight I couldn't really slide the stitches down the needle so um, something to add to your skill or your repertoire knitting repertoire but something to keep in mind if you have a hand injury and maybe you know need a little help or yeah well of course you know historically speaking she was talking about how women would walk and knit at the same time I can't see us really I mean we do do that today but I don't know about walking with a thing and the needle sticking out I don't know that might be a problem uh, but yeah so that was really neat that was really interesting I was really happy that I was able to give that a go and again if you're in the area and you're able to go to this little textile museum I highly recommend it uh, yeah, I think that's about it for me uh, for this particular episode. Wish me luck uh, on the sponsored walk tomorrow. <laughs> and um, hopefully uh, I will be recovered in time to be able to see you again next week. Uh, same time, same bat channel. Until then, I hope that you have happy knitting. I hope that you stay healthy. And I hope that you get out there and make some magical memories of your own. Bye. Mm. Yeah. Coca-Cola and espresso brownie. Woo! to rock. <laughs>